Hi there, yes, my name's Steve Carroll, and I'm here to talk to you about Rococo with the title Rococo, the first pop art question mark. And I'd like to show you during this course of this um, lecture why I've come to suggest that it was the first pop art. And uh, I'd like to first of all start off by saying that at one time, R Rococo was absolutely my least favourite art movement. In fact, I don't think I liked it at all. I, I, I hated it. I've actually stood in front of audiences such as this and really knocked this painting here. This is The Swing or The Happy Accidents of the Swing by Jean-Honoré Fragonard from 1767. And this is in the Wallace collection, I'm sure you know. They're very proud of it. They put it on everything they can on the front of their guidebooks, uh, their plastic bags, their mugs with this on. And it's one that I really disliked. If I was going to describe this in two words, I would say it is frilly and silly. What it depicts is a lady on a swing. And if you look at the way in which the swing has been hung, there is no way that swing would go straight. It's uh, very, very awkward with the two ropes the way they are. And uh, she's in this lovely pink dress and she's kicking off her shoe at a man who's in a rose bush. Very, very... Um, uncomfortable I would imagine and he's looking up her skirt and it's not just the dress that's frilly all the leaves are frilly in the trees all the uh, bushes and the plants are frilly and even the man in the rose bush is frilly as well and uh, if but however if you look at this painting in real life when you go to the Wallace collection this really does knock your socks off a friend of mine was looking at this with me and she said she'd always seen this uh, painting in, you know, books on, you know, art through the ages, that type of thing. But she'd never realised just how beautiful it was. When you look at that lady in pink and the way she floats within this painting, my friend said it's almost like 3D, almost like a holographic image. It is so convincing the way in which that uh, forest in the background goes off into the distance, whereas this lady comes into the foreground and hangs there in the air. I, I, I've come to really love this painting. Uh, there's a few things about this which are particularly very Rococo. Let's just talk about the word Rococo. I'm sure you know that it's the combination of two French words for a rock and a shell. It was a word coined after this art period was over. And uh, when it was considered to be something very frivolous and something of the aristocracy who had all had their heads chopped off in the French Revolution. Um, but one of the things that is very beautiful about this, and it's something which uh, Fragonard got from the artist who we'll be looking at later on, which is Anton Votto, um, is, is that light. It's a very theatrical light coming through the trees and glancing onto the lady in pink. Now, um, the person who, as I say, Fragonard was inspired by was Votto, and one of his first jobs was painting for the Parisian Opera. And he used to paint backgrounds, landscapes for the operas. And there is something about this which is very theatric. It's almost as if there's a special spotlight on this lady. It reminds me of a saying by another Rococo artist, um, Francois Boucher, who said that nature is far too green and badly lit. I wonder what Fragonard thought of that. Uh, this is actually very green and uh, the lighting is, is really quite beautiful. The other Rococo device are the statues. Look at how right on the far left you've got Cupid. A Cupid, of course, being the offspring of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And Cupid is, is his finger to his lips and he's going, Shh, there's a secret going on here. This is all about secret love. And over on the right, you have an elderly man, so elderly he's sitting down and he's pulling the lady on the swing. And uh, some have suggested that is an, an elderly husband and others have suggested that's actually a clergyman. But uh, he's totally unaware of the man in the bushes who's very red faced. It's almost like the pink of the dress is reflecting in his face and his face is totally spellbound as he looks up her dress. How naughty. I understand that this painting is so naughty that it actually was uh, banned from being exhibited in 
in Paris, which is um, saying something, isn't it? So um, I now really love this painting. I think it's a stunning painting. And I'm going to show you how I came to love Rococo and how I came to see it as the first pop art. We're going to be looking at two artists side by sides who typify uh, Rococo and then pop art. The first is Anton Votto, the second is Andy Warhol, who both have the same initials. I suddenly noticed as I was putting this presentation together, but uh, that wasn't on purpose. Anton Votto, it's spelt Votto as if with a V because the part of France he came from had once been Dutch and they had Dutch names. He lived from 1684 to 1721. He didn't live very long. He suffered from breathing problems all his life. And uh, he had a specialist doctor in London who he used to go to see. Funny to think of London as a place where you go for breathing problems, but he did. And he used to paint some rather saucy paintings for this doctor in London uh, as payment. On the other side, we have Andy Warhol, 1928 to 1987. Still didn't make it to his 60s. Also a very um, ill gentleman. When he was a child, he actually had St Vitus dance. He was um, uh, in, in bed a lot of his time, couldn't go to school. And whilst he was in bed away from school, he got into reading Hollywood magazines about the celebrities and the film stars. And that's how he became so... Uh, attracted to the whole idea of celebrity. What I want to do is show you how these two men's lives are, there's huge parallels. And here I'm not talking about just coincidences, like the fact that they've got the same initials. I'm talking about the fact that the spirit of Rococo is very similar, I believe, to the philosophy of pop art. Let's have a look. Before we look at Rococo, the first thing I want to do is look at the fact that both pop art and Rococo had precedents in the art in the artistic world, which were totally different to themselves. Very, very different indeed. Rococo is seen as frivolous. But before Rococo, you had a century of the Baroque. This is a painting by Peter Paul Rubens, The Massacre of the Innocent, 1609 to 11. It's a horrific painting and it's painted at a time of a, quite a horrific time because the 17th century was the age of the wars of religion due to the counter reformation. Now the reformation had taken place in the early 16th century with people like Martin Luther and Calvin. And it was a, an attempt to reform the church, not to start another denomination, but they ended up starting basically another church, which was Protestantism. And Protestantism was growing, taking root in Europe. And the Pope didn't like that because he was basically losing territory and influence. I mean, so he started a project called the Counter-Reformation, which is a way of fighting back. And it led to some terrible wars, one of them being the Eighty Years' War um, between uh, the Netherlands and Spain. And there's something of this uh, tumultuous, um, horrendous uh, image that reminds me of that time. It was a very difficult, very dark time. It was an incredibly serious time. And um, the interesting thing about Rubens, many people think about Rubens, well, I've seen Rubens all over the place. Every gallery, every stately home seems to have a Rubens. But in his time, he was considered a really bad boy. The person you were supposed to look at was a chap called Nicholas Pusan, who was a very classical painter. But if you were a rebel, you were into Rubens because he had completely he had bad influences on students. That's what the academies thought. Uh, the reason is because you may know Rubens rather liked big girlies and uh, they thought that he put his own personal view of beauty before the classical view of beauty. He was too individual in his taste and he reflected that in his painting. So he was looked down on. However, saying that, I don't see much of that in this painting here, which is quite horrendous. Now compare that with this by Votto. This is Mezzotine. Now, Votto was very much in love with the idea of the comedy Italiane. The, uh, this was a, uh, uh, an acting troupe, a, co a comedic troupe of actors who'd come from Italy and they toured France. They were very famous. However, they'd made some rather uh, unpleasant remarks about um, the king's uh, very pious wife. And so King Louis XVI, sorry, I think that's Louis XV, had them thrown out of the uh of, of the of, of the country and so what then happened was there were some french actors who tried to basically do the same thing and 
what uh, happened was they weren't so good. And there was this great nostalgia for the comedy Italian. I guess you could say it's a bit like a nostalgia for the Beatles now. And you can go to a Beatles tribute band, but it's nothing like seeing the real thing, is it? Uh, so this is what um, he um, made as his subject, the comedy Italian. And he depicted the different characters that were in that uh, that troupe. And here is the minstrel Mezzatine. And the joke about Mezzatine is that he was constantly in love. If you look at him now in this picture, he seems to be playing a serenade for somebody, somebody he's in love with, so maybe a lady up on a balcony, but he's not getting anywhere. And do you remember what I was saying about the the statues, how they have a, um, a, a, a role to play in this painting? Do you see how um, the statue has her back to him? rather like the lady probably up on the balcony has got her back to him as well he's a completely love lost poor old soul we'll see a bit of him later um now the precursor before um pop art the um the movement that that came before andy warhol's time was of course abstract expressionism and this was a, uh, a a style which started, you know, really during the Second World War and really came to light in the 50s. I consider abstract expressionism to be the, the, the last great art movement. I think what's happened since then has been a bit fractured. It's it, the, 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 you don't get movements like the abstract expressionists who seem to have a philosophy and seem to be all uh, singing off the same hymn sheet. This is Mark Rothko's Black in Deep Red from 1957, uh, one of the Seagram murals. Uh, and the inspiration for this was um, uh, Rothko had gone on holiday and he'd seen the, the Medici Library. And it was uh, a, a, a building and part of it was actually designed by Michelangelo. And in the building, there were these blind windows. In order to make the, the interior of this building look balanced, they had windows over there with glass in them. And in order to balance it, they put blind windows, which just were just completely stone windows. But it was a, a decorative thing and it balanced it out. And when he looked at those blind windows, he thought to himself, that's how it feels to be alive now. Because you realise that Rothko was painting during the Cold War. And there was the fear that somebody somewhere would press a button and it would start a global nuclear war and mankind would just be wiped out. There'd be no more Mozart, no more Shakespeare, no more Impressionism, no more art, no culture, no science, nothing, because humanity would be completely wiped out. And this was his reaction when he's painting these. They're like basically windows going to nowhere. So this was the backdrop to um, Andy Warhol becoming an artist. I'd like to just show you a little bit more because um, Andy Warhol and pop art was the beginning of a completely new phase in visual art. I'm going to talk to you now a little bit about postmodernism. I've just got three slides. Now, I've got books at home on postmodernism. There are about two inches thick, you know, 500, 700 pages. I'm going to give you a very quick um, explanation of, of, of how I see uh, postmodernism and its effect upon art. If you go right back, right back all the way to the Dark Ages, that's really where Western civilization was crystallized, the Western civilization that we uh, know today. And the two great authorities, one was the church, the other was the aristocracy, the ruling class. And for centuries and centuries, there were these two powers. The church was all about your worldview, your spiritual beliefs, where you were going, why you were here. And the aristocracy were really the ruling class. They were the ones who made the big decisions, whether we went to war, what type of agriculture we had. They were the ones who were buying all the art, as was the church. As you come into the late 19th uh, to early 20th century, you see things changing. You see the influence of the church uh, disappearing sl slowly. And you also see the influence and the power of the aristocracy disappearing. And what was taking over in the early 20th century among many intellectuals and many artists was a belief called theosophy. This was the new spiritual belief 
And one of the figureheads was this lady here, Madame Blavatsky. Madame Blavatsky was a Russian woman who'd studied comparative religion. And what she was basically saying was all the religions are the same. And basically we have to find the spiritual and the spiritual is more real than the physical. And this is a very Eastern belief. And many early artists in the 20th century were theosophists, uh, Mondrian, Kandinsky, even Jackson Pollock um, actually uh, flirted with it. And then on the other side, the political side, instead of the aristocracy, we had Marx calling for workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. And so there was a completely new way of looking at the world coming in with communism. And of course, many of the early artists, again, in the 20th century were communists. People like Picasso and George Grotz were actually members of the Communist Party. However, what happened during the 20th century, and especially with the Second World War and its aftermath, was these two things changed. First of all, Madame Blavatsky and her followers were began to see be seen as a bunch of cranks and a bunch of frauds. And then with the reign of terror under Stalin, Karl Marx's ideas were being questioned. And what happened as you come out of the, the Second World War going really into the 60s is that there is no truth. You make your own truth. You can't look outside to any authority to find the truth. You make it yourself. And this is what we call post-modernism. And so the way it affected art was that instead of going to always um, portraying thing, the traditional things like landscapes, portraits of the great and good, religious subjects, history painting, battle scenes, um, suddenly anything could be art. Even the lowest form of art could be lifted up to become high art. In fact, there was no difference between low and high art. And so Roy Lichtenstein found a frame in a comic book and he blew it up to about seven or eight foot high. And you'll notice it is actually in two parts, like a diptych, like a religious painting. But instead of it being um, a religious subject, it's something from a comic book. It's also interesting because what you've got there is a Corsair blowing up a MiG. And I think this is a reference to the Korean War. Suddenly, low art or popular culture could suddenly be uh, put into a frame and put into an art gallery. Now, in comes Andy Warhol. One of the things I want to notice about the similarities between Andy Warhol and Anton Votto is that they both started off very much in the commercial sector before they went towards what we would call fine art. And Andy Warhol, he basically graduated from art college when the, the Second World War was changing, was, was had finished. And uh, he started off going into the late 40s and 50s uh, as an illustrator working for very, very fashionable, glossy magazines in New York. And he was known as Raggedy Andy because he came in looking a little bit disheveled. Whenever he used to present artwork to the editor of a magazine, he always used to bring it in a brown paper bag. And his work was very popular. The way in which he would do an image like this is he would actually, first of all, paint with black Indian ink, an image on paper. And then what he would do is he would actually put blotting paper over the top and he would blot it. And then the impression would come out on the blotting paper. So it was very much like a print, what we would call a monoprint. And then what he would do was with watercolors, he would actually um, paint uh, in, in the color. And uh, his work would be um, published. He was very popular. He also made a lot of money. In fact, I think that's really what financed um, his ability to go into fine art was he actually did have quite a lot of capital. He lived with his mother. He didn't have any great expenses. Uh, so he was doing very well. Um, this picture here, just as you know, he did have, a, he was asked to do an awful lot of shoes. But this is the, the work that he did. In one of the magazines, they spelt his, when they put the credit, they spelt his name wrong. And they, instead of it being Andy Warholler, they changed it to Andy Warhol. And he just decided, oh, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as my name. 
Now, when we go over to Votto, remember I said that Votto did start um, painting the Paris backgrounds, backdrops for the Parisian opera. Uh, he also did uh, a lot of decorative work in rather expensive homes. And his master, the person he trained under, was Claude Audran, lived from 1658 to 1734. And the image with the pink background, this is a work by Claude Audran. And you'll see that uh, it, 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 it obviously looks very, you know, very of the period. But what it has in the middle is an allegorical woman on a cloud. So there's something quite classical about this. And she's uh, representing summer. So there she is. She's got a sheaf of corn. And there's next to her a, a kind of a Cupid type, beauty type character with a scythe. And so this is all about harvest. You've got the... A straw hat here, you've got the tools of harvesting, you've got dried flowers, it's all very late summer going towards autumn. Over here you have the Votto and it's really quite different. Yes, it's it's a little less uh, cluttered, it's um, a little bit more um, uh, mathematical in the way in which it's been laid out. And then the main subject isn't an allegorical figure, it's two characters. To, uh, and I, I believe if you look at them, they're basically characters from the um, from the comedy Italian. Uh, he's in slightly theatrical dress with that staff. But here you have something which is really popular art. You're talking about, as I've said, you know, they were considered a little bit like we would consider the Beatles. They were considered as popular entertainment. So suddenly, instead of having allegorical things which refer to the ancients, the classical past, you suddenly have in the middle of this decoration somebody something from popular culture. Now, um, the uh, so when we're talking about popular culture, of course, this is the thing that um, Warhol uh, loved. I've spoken to you about the magazines that he read as a child, and this is one of his screen prints. It's quite a, a life-size canvas. It's rather large, and it's called Triple Elvis. And what he's done is he has screen printed. Elvis Presley three times so that they overlap and it's on um, a, a silver coloured uh, canvas. Uh, so the, the use of uh, screen printing, which was a commercial way of printing things, you would print boxes, you would print posters, all sorts of things in those days using screen printing. Screen printing is where you create a stencil and this was created through a photographic process. This image here is probably one that he's cut out of a magazine or even a newspaper. It's got it's like it's tiny little dot formation that they print these things with. And he's blown it up large, created a really large photographic image that's been um, for a photographic purpose uh, process, been turned into a stencil. And then basically ink is squeezed through the screen onto the canvas. And what you've got there is basically three. There's just one 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 screen print one screen rather sorry of, of Elvis and he's just like printed him over overlapping. Uh, one of the stories about this is that Warhol actually gave Bob Dylan as a present uh, one of these triple Elvis uh, images and uh, he found out that Bob Dylan was using it as a dartboard which upset him incredibly. Another great um, image of course for Warhol used was Marilyn Monroe. Now this again is called Marilyn Diptych. Again, rather like the Liechtenstein painting Wham, this is a diptych. So again, you can't help thinking there's a reference here to religious imagery. And in fact, an important fact about Andy Warhol was that he was a Catholic. Although he was a gay man, he was also a, considered himself a devout Catholic. He went to church every Sunday. He didn't. He used to hang around at the back and just watch what was going on. He felt a little bit distanced from it. But there's uh, many ways in which you can look and read a painting like this. Again, it's screen printed. But on the left, we have screen printing and paint. So basically, they have painted images which are screen printed over the top. And on the right, you just have screen printing just in black. And um, you can look at her in, in, in different ways. In uh, Marilyn over the, uh, the left hand side, she's overcolored, she's false, she's artificial, and she's stacked up rather like those soup cans that he did. If you go into um, 
shops in New York. When I was in New York uh, around about this time last year, and I couldn't get over just how beautifully stacked and presented all the uh, shelves were in New York stores. And that's how Marilyn has been portrayed here. She's like a product. You just take her off the shelf and she's just sold to you for your entertainment. Doesn't matter where she is. However, on the other side, we have a very different Marilyn. We've got a Marilyn who is where the colour isn't there. And what he's done here is he's screen printed. And over on that second column, you'll notice there's just too much ink. In fact, the, the second one down is totally obscured. And what's happened here is he has what we call flooded the screen. He's put too much ink on the screen. And what you do when you, you do that is you then have to do some prints onto something like newspaper uh, and keep doing it until you've cleaned the screen and it's ready to use again. But Warhol has kept that in. And, and one of the things about uh, Marilyn is that she suffered from um, depression greatly. And what you I seem to feel in that second column is the depressed Marilyn, the person who's got feelings. And then as you go along further across to the right, you see Marilyn fading away. Now, some people have said of Warhol that he was just a, a, a person out for money and he just used people, trod over people, that type of thing. But I can't help seeing very often in his work something incredibly sensitive, something where he really has feelings for people. He is aware that he's part of this industry that is turning people into commodities, into products off the shelf. But at the same time, he's understanding that inside those people, there is a real person, somebody with feelings and somebody who's fading away. I find this a very powerful piece of work indeed. Now, when we come to Votto, we've spoken about Warhol's interest in popular culture. And remember, Watto, Votto as well was very interested in po popular culture. Um, he entered the um, the, the Parisian Academy. He, uh, what, what, when you go into the academy, the, the way you do it is you have an, like an entrance piece, and if you're, if they people like it, then you become a fellow of the Royal Academy. But what you have to do is a reception piece. And the reception piece is a large painting which you have to do, and you have to actually give a speech and explain why you did what you did. And this was his reception piece. It actually took quite a long time to paint because he kept getting interrupted with commissions for portraiture because Votto was becoming quite popular. And this is a painting called the Embarca Embarkation for Cythera, or sometimes referred to the Embarkation for, for the Island of Love. And you have uh, people on an island and they're all um, going down to this golden barge and they're going to be taken away. Some people think the, the, the title is wrong and that it should be the, the embarkation from the, the island of love but anyway here they are and it's an interesting composition i always think to myself when i look at things like this where does your eye go first my eye goes first to this lady here but then there is this thing called a form um this classical um piece uh, sculpture here i think my eye seems to go down there to the lady here and then along the line and then you get to this little puff of beauty like that it's it's a quite um a, a wonderful painting. It's in the Louvre. You it has a, this a, quite an ethereal feel to it. And this was the painting which really switched me on to this idea of Rococo being the first pop art because this was actually based on a popular play at the time. And I thought to myself, this is really interesting. The idea of a reception piece going into the Parisian Academy and it not being based on the classics on the scenes from the Bible, on history painting, on battles and things like that, or paintings of the great and good. But the idea of being painted about a popular play, it's almost like you're doing a painting based on EastEnders or Coronation Street or something like that. And this is what really switched me on to this idea that Rococo was the first pop art. He did another version of this, and this one's in Berlin, in, whereas the first one is rather ethereal. This one's a little bit more solid. And uh, you have a similar composition, uh, different statues, a few more pupi, uh, cupids or putti around here. 
and you have another a far more defined statue you have the same lady with the white uh, skirt here the same man with the staff here and you go down this time there's a far more substantial boat because i think you'd need a bit bigger boat than that last one to get all those people on and you've got this puff of beauty now when i was about 15 or so and my parents realized that i was getting into art they bought for me, me for my birthday a book called The Art of the Fantastic. And it was one of these books which has pictures by Hieronymus Bosch, Salvador Dali, René Magritte, uh, 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 um, all those types of people. And it also had this painting in. And I wasn't, again, I wasn't very interested in it. It didn't do anything for me. I looked at a painting like this at those days and I was far more interested in Chelsea beating Stoke. Uh, but there was one thing that my 15 year old imagination did notice, and it was this, that if you look over on the right hand side and you look at that lady in the white skirt and you look at her face and then you look up at that statue and you look at her face, you suddenly realise they're the same woman. And what seems to be happening, I'll just show you a little bit something here. What seems to be happening here is that Votto seems to be undressing that lady. It's almost as if this man here who's flirting with this woman, that's his imagination up here, that she's some uh, classical naked goddess or something. And if you think that's just my imagination as a 15 year old, I think I can show other examples of that. If you look at this uh, wonderful painting here, the Fate, Ital sorry, Fate Venetians, the uh, this is basically a dance that is going on. There's characters in the background from the comedy Italian. And there you have a the woman in the middle in white. Her name is Isabella. Now, she's um, considered to be in the comedy Italian a sort of a Juliet character. I don't think that she's actually as, 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 as serious as Juliet. I think of her a bit like the woman in, um, uh, in The Importance of Being Earnest. Uh, she took herself a little bit too seriously. Now, she is being uh, asked to dance by a man dressed as a Turk. And if you look on the other side, on the uh, uh, right edge, there's a man playing bagpipes. Now, the man playing bagpipes is actually Votto himself. And over on the other side, the man dressed as a Turk was his best friend at the time, who he was actually lodging with. Now, Votto never bought a house. He never uh, seemed to even rent premises. He used to actually just, just lodge with other people, a bit like a, you know, a sofa surfer or something like that. Um, and this is his best friend. And right in the middle, you've got Isabella. And you know the painting is about Isabella because there's this urn at the top, the ornamental urn, which looks like an arrow pointing down at her. You cannot get away from the fact that these two guys are looking at this beautiful woman. And it's basically almost as if they're having a conversation about her. And then you look in the background, there's a man here who's gesturing up to that statue of a very, very voluptuous naiad. And people sometimes ask me, what is this painting about? Well, in this case, I think this painting basically is saying, I bet she looks great naked. I can't see any other thing that, it, that, that it's saying. It's very much a lad's painting. And you might not like this. You might consider this misogynistic. But um, I think that's what it that's 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 the meaning. I can't get away from it. Now, when we get to this whole area of um, sauciness, <clears throat> uh, Andy Warhol was living during the permissive 1960s. He was a gay man. He was surrounded by drug addicts and um, drag queens in his studio in New York, which is the studio he referred to as the factory. And one part of Andy Warhol's corpus uh, is his movies, which I have to say aren't my favourite part of Andy Warhol. And when he went um, into the area of eroticism, he, he went really did go into it. And it's not really a type of art that, that I like. It's not it's not my my scene. Uh, but this is uh, a painting of one of his super sorry, a, a, an image from a film of one of his superstar stars, Edie Sedgwick who was the daughter of a, a very well-to-do, from a very well-to-do family. Uh, sadly, she got into drugs and she ended up dying of a drug overdose, but she was a very beautiful woman. 
Um, the other uh, films that he would make, uh, uh, sorry, no, he didn't make this film. This is actually, um, yeah, the other films he made, sorry, were the, uh, the, the, the silent movie, 24 hour silent movie of the Empire State Building, which, uh, again, um, yeah, it's not really my scene. But when we talk about uh, commercialism, this is the other thing that Votto and Andy Warhol have in common, is they had a commercial side to what they did. And when I mean that, I don't mean just selling paintings, I mean actual applied art. And this is one of the projects that he was involved with. Uh, he actually started was Interview Magazine, which I understand is still going. It was founded in 1969. These are some covers from the 80s. I think you can recognize some of the people there. There's um, Mick Jagger at the top there, Jerry Hall, Madonna. In fact, there's two Madonnas there. There's Sylvester Stallone. There's Bette Midler. There's Divine, Dolly Parton, uh, Lisa Minnelli and John Travolta, among others. Um, this was a magazine, again, it was a celebrity magazine, but um, he, poor old Andy Warhol, didn't always have editorial control, and sometimes ideas that he came up with were thrown out. But this was very much a commercial side to him. The other commercial side was his celebrity portraits, and what he would do was he would take Polaroids of the famous, you know, the people, um, art dealers, film stars, sports stars, pop stars, and he would uh, again make these screens, but then he would paint them in these rather remarkable colors. And this one here, which is just one I found which I particularly like, it's simply called Scandinavian Beauty. I don't know who it's actually of, but um, he would, you know, he, 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 he painted everybody, Mick Jagger, Truman Capote, um, Grace Jones, all these big celebrities of the time uh, he, he would paint. So this was his, um, his very commercial side to him. And in uh, Rococo, there's also a commercial side. This is one of my favorite paintings by Votto. This is called Gilet. And uh, this is a comical character in the Comedy Italian and uh, He's basically was um, he, he he evolved into the character we know as Piero, but uh, Gilet was always the butt of the jokes. And there he is, and he's got this costume where his sleeves are too long and they're, they're rolled up, and his trousers are too short. And he sits there with this, this, this stands there with this rather um, uh, innocent look to him. And this uh, was actually um, a commercial uh, commission for a signboard. For uh, one of the the the, com the you know the the faux comedy Italian troops that were going around, this was basically an advertising board. And what's going on in the background is that there's some people there who are leading onto the back of the stage area a donkey. Now, what would happen is that somebody would actually crack a joke at the expense of the character Gilet. Gilet would stand there in total innocence, not knowing what was going on, and as the other troops would lead a donkey across the back. It's a bit like when in a, uh, you know, a comedy situation, when somebody goes or wah, 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 that type of thing. And so the joke is at the expense of him. I've always thought to myself, it's very interesting how those two trees uh, seem to have uh, grown donkey's ears uh, over on the right. And of course, was also over the on the right, there's a form and the form is a satire, which is, of course, you know, where we get the word satirical from. But this is a wonderful painting. It's in the Louvre and it's it's uh, almost, uh, I seem to remember, it's almost life size, the character of Gilet. But he often put Gilet as a central stage, almost like a Christ figure, people have suggested. And it reminds me of something that Cecil Collins once said when he said, the saint, the poet and the fool are one. It's almost like the Shakespearean fool who's the only one who's actually telling the truth. Uh, he seems to see Gilet as being somebody, although he's the butt of a joke, he's actually the one who's actually telling the truth. I almost feel that uh, Votto was identifying with Gilet. Another commercial uh, um, commission that he received, and this is one, I think, believe this was, yes, this was his last uh, major painting by Votto, was this um, one of a gallery. This is the, the shop sign for Gossin, which is a, a, an art gallery. 
And this is really quite a huge painting. And it was actually put up outside the gallery. And it was so remarkable that when uh, people, uh, you know, carriages went past, they used to ask the driver to stop so they could look at the picture. And it used to cause traffic jams. And, you know, the people used to say, come on, move on, get out of the way, all this type of thing. There's some satire in this. You'll notice how the king is being put away in a box. That's a little bit of a political comment. There's the, one of the things about Votto is his depiction of fabric, which is absolutely second to none. Uh, it, you feel you could almost run your hand through that silk on those dresses. It's so realistic. I love the man in grey who's bending down to get a de see a, a detail with a magnifying glass here. Now, I used to look at this painting and I used to think, oh, yeah, I recognise that one up there. Yeah, oh, that's that's Raphael, that's, that's Rembrandt, that's, you know. Apparently, none of those paintings really existed, as, as far as I know. Um, he did this painting in about five months. And he did all of those just out of his imagination. He just thought, oh, what would something by Velazquez look like? Oh, like that. What would a Rembrandt look like? What would a Raphael look like? What would a Tintoretto look like? Something like that. And he just made them up. And I think that is absolutely fantastic. Very remarkable. Um, dear old Votto uh, didn't live long after painting this picture. He, as I say, he was suffered from terrible breathing problems. It could have been tuberculosis. I'm not sure what it was. He, towards the end of his life, he made friends with a priest, maybe aware of his own mortality and asking the question, where do I go next? And he made friends with this priest and I think it had a profound effect upon him because he had a lot of paintings which were, as I say, rather saucy. Lots of nudes which were a little bit not so much artistic as a bit risque. And he actually destroyed them all out of respect for the priest and uh, his newfound faith. He then went off home, <clears throat> to, uh, got on board a carriage to go to see his parents because he was concerned he wasn't going to live very long. And sadly, he died on the way, never getting to see his parents. When we talk about the role of religion, Andy Warhol was, as I think I've said, a devout Catholic, as well as being a gay man. And towards the end of his life, this was his last uh, serious uh, full-size painting. He um, depicts the Last Supper covered in camouflage. He did several of these, not all of them with camouflage. He, did, he was always experimenting with different things. But these ones with camouflage were the last one, among the last ones he did. He didn't actually copy um, Leonardo da Vinci's version. He didn't get a print of that. He basically got a, a, a print of somebody else who had copied so, um, Leonardo da Vinci. So it's quite interesting that it's actually not even based on the real thing. It's actually based on a copy. Is this whole idea of things of things being mass produced and throw away? And he blows this thing up to a huge size. I mean, this is the same size as the actual original uh, Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. But in this one, he covers it in camouflage. And I've often wondered to myself, what is going on here? You often we think of you know stories of gay people having to hide their sexuality from people. But in this case, it's I feel that like he's saying that he had to hide his Catholicism from people. Being Catholic wasn't very trendy in the circles that he moved, he moved in. And this is all about him actually hiding his Catholicism. Andy Warhol was actually uh, shot in 1969. He didn't die, obviously. He was shot by a woman called Valerie Solaris, who was a militant feminist who had a society called the called Scum, the Society for Cutting Up Men. But she was the only member of that society, and she wrote propaganda, anti-male propaganda, and she became one of Warhol's superstars in that she had a uh, like a, a video portrait, a movie portrait they used to call of her. Uh, she wasn't very popular among the. Warhol superstars. She was considered as a, a little bit difficult. Uh, and one of the, the effects they had was that he, he had to close down the factory, his original studio, where he had all the drug dealers and, you know, people off the street coming in. And he started a new 
studio, which he referred to as The Office. And The Office was a lot more commercial, a lot more business-like uh, than the, the factory. I personally think no interesting stuff came out of the factory. But so he had The Office. And one of the things he had to do is he had to go in for regular health checks. And he, 1987, he went into the hospital for a health check and somebody made an error with his medication and he died. Uh, he was only, um, he wasn't even 60. Uh, and he died, there were no cameras on him. You know, he was somebody who was constantly being followed by paparazzi, constantly being filmed, constantly wanting to be photographed next to people. And he lost, he basically lost his life as in complete silence and complete solitude. It's very sad. I'd like to finish now also with a rather melancholy picture. And this is one of my favourite um, paintings by Votto. It's called The Two Cousins. It's in the Louvre. It's uh, quite a small picture, only about A3 size. It depicts two young girls in beautiful, typically Votto dresses. They seem to be in a, a, the grounds of a stately home. There's a lake there with a classical statue across the other side, in fact, two classical statues. There's a young man who seems to be flirting with one of them, but the other woman is, a young woman is standing very alert, very uh, noble, with great dignity, looking across the other side where there seem to be other people. Maybe this is a some kind of, you know, a, a, a party. Maybe this is some kind of gathering of socialites, something like that. And it's twilight. The sun is disappearing and the light is disappearing. And I can't help looking at this and thinking to myself, there's some way this depicts both Rococo and pop art, that they are all about the here and now. If you're about popular culture, then it's going to be just about a very short span of time. We were always told at school that if you're going to write a story, never put anything from popular culture in it because it will date it. Don't mention the Beatles, don't mention Led Zeppelin or any TV programme because it will date, date that uh, piece of writing very quickly. But what Rococo and Pop Art are about are very much about popular culture, fixing something to a point, a certain point when everything was happy, when everything was beautiful, when everything was good. But just like the twilight, those worlds will fade away. The Rococo style was destroyed with the coming of the French Revolution. Pop art was destroyed with the end of the 60s. Warhol being shot, the Beatles breaking up. It was, we, as we're going, they went into the 70s. It became a new era. Both of them died and both of them have a kind of melancholy air about them, I think. So my hope is that this presentation may have ignited an interest in Rococo if you liked pop art or in pop art if you liked Rococo. Thank you.